Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about and learn about Thucydides flap. Thucydides is the Greek pronunciation for this particular word. I, in this video, to make it closer and simpler for pronunciation and make it much more closer or a little closer to its phonetic spelling, I'm going to pronounce this at Thucytus. However, you understand that the correct Greek pronunciation is Thucydides. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to pronounce it as Thucytus. We're going to understand this from the perspective of political science and international relations optional examination. And there's one particular reason why. What is happening is that the Thucytus trap is being continuously used within contemporary politics. It has been used in reference to the Russia-Ukraine war. Nevertheless, it has also been used in reference to India and China relationship. It is in this context that the Cider's trap becomes important from perspective of paper 2, section A, comparative political analysis or specifically international politics. The subsection approaches to study of international relations, realism. Thucydides trap, therefore, we're going to learn as part of classical realism in international relations. Paper 2, section 8. The first thing that you need to understand is who was Thucydides? Now, he was a Greek historian and philosopher. He wrote a famous book known as the History of the Peloponnesian War. And he wrote it around 430 BC, around that time only. And this particular book, History of the Peloponnesian War and Sun Tzu's Art of War, were written around the same time. And Andrew Haywood, a famous theorist, whose book we all refer when learning about international relations theory, in particularly in reference to paper 2 and section A. And he has said, specifically about the history of the Peloponnesian War, that this book, given by Thucydides and Sun Tzu's Art of War, lay the genesis for classical realism theory. It lays, both these books, lay the genesis for classical realism theory. It is therefore, it becomes important for your PSIR optional examination. And because it has been continuously used for the past few years in reference to the Russia-Ukraine war, now also in reference to India and China, it furthermore becomes important for your PSIR examination. Two sides. There were two main powers during that time. Athens and Sparta. Sparta was the dominant power. Athens was the rising power. The Peloponnesian War happened between these two Greek city-states, between Sparta, which was the hegemon or the dominant power, and Athens, which was the rising power. Now, specifically, it has been used in context of U.S. and China. Where U.S., similar to Sparta, is the hegemon or the dominant power. And similar to Athens, China is the rising power. Now, what had happened during the Peloponnesian War is that Athens, which was the rising power, lost the Peloponnesian War. And Sparta, which was the hegemon, won and became the dominant power in the Greek world. Both of them were vying for supremacy or dominance of the Greek world. But because of their conflict between Athens and Sparta, what finally happened after the war was over, after the, war was over the Greek Golden Age ended. The war between two of the largest states within the Greek city-states led to the collapse of the Greek Golden Age. 
Now Thucydides becomes important in this because he was an Athenian general and he fought on behalf of Athens. However, what happened is that during one of the battles, he lost. And he was exiled by Athens for 20 years. And during those 20 years, Thucydides ended up writing history of the Peloponnesian War. So he was not just an outsider overlooking the Peloponnesian War. He was not an historian who wrote about the Peloponnesian War after it had happened. He was an actual participant in the Peloponnesian War. And when it ended and during the period that it was happening, he wrote the book, History of the Peloponnesian War. Therefore, he is assumed and considered one of the first realists in Aya theory. And his book, therefore, History of the Peloponnesian War, lays the genesis of classical realism. Why? That we'll understand throughout this video. Now, what had happened is that during the Peloponnesian War, Athens lost Sparta won, who was the hegemon, it was the rising power. And in this context, Thucydides ended up writing, it was the rise of Athens that instilled a fear in Sparta that made war inevitable. He lays the cause of the Peloponnesian War, that because of the rise of Athens, Sparta became fearful. And because Sparta became fearful and Sparta had insecurity, war between both Athens and Sparta was inevitable. It was bound to happen. And this is in, used in context to US and China. The rise of China has instilled a fear in the United States that we all know. Now is war inevitable? Will learn throughout this video as to what is the views of the scholar in reference to Thucydides trap. And this, what I have explained to you, that when a power rises and it causes a fear in the dominant power, that is known as the Thucydides trap. This fear from a rising power is the Thucydides trap. In reference to this, uh, in reference to the book History of the Peloponnesian War and what Thucydides has written, an important aspect, an unrelated important aspect that comes out is the Melian Dialogue. If you see in this map, there is a small island, there is a small island known as Melos. Now Melos is basically a colony of Sparta. But during the Peloponnesian War, it wanted to remain neutral. However, Athens went to Melos and said that you join Athens against Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. However, Melos or Melians, they ended up saying that war is not just. War is not just, they gave moral and idealistic arguments as to why the Peloponnesian War or the war between Sparta and Athens should not happen. And they gave these moralistic and idealistic views to Athens. What happened afterwards? Athens ended up going into Melos and killing every able-bodied person there. They completely destroy the island of Melos. In this context, the Melian dialogue becomes important. This dialogue basically shows the difference between idealism, liberalism, and realist thinking. Melians who gave idealistic and moralistic argument that war is not just, you should resolve it through, uh, through negotiations, by talking to each other, while Athens, which was the realistic argument that they gave, standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel, and that in fact, the strong do what they have to do, 
or they have the power to do and the weak accept what they have to accept or what they have to accept the athenians ended up saying that we are the powerful and might is right a famous saying might is right and because of this they said because we are the powerful city state you bow down to us and you accept what we have to tell you what we need from you this is the million dialogue million gave idealistic moralistic arguments athenians said no they said might is right they also ended up saying that justice is always on the side of the stronger this is not the law that the athenians have made ourselves or they were the first to act upon it but it was already in existence and we should leave it to exist forever among those who come after us they have said the idea that might is right that the powerful do what they have to do and the weak have to accept what the powerful are doing is not something that the athenians have created it has existed in the past and they don't know who gave this law gave this understanding but it has always existed and it will continue to exist to among those who come after the athenians also so this argument with regards to justice that the million people were giving idealistic and moralistic arguments they say justice is not that justice is on the side of the strong if you look at idealism and liberalism today the norms in ia theory given by idealist and liberal thinkers they're basically a negation of this idea that justice is not on the side of the strong the justice have to be equal to all participants in the international system all the norms given by liberal and idealist thinkers are, ne are negation of what the athenians have said in the past that might is not right that is the arguments given by idealists and realists that might is not right the powerful do not have the right to do what they do and the weak do not have to accept what the powerful want them to do that is the idealist and liberal thinking in ia theory a complete negation of what the athenians have been saying in reference to this in reference to this let us understand as to what thucydides had said the first reference he makes to is what is the cause of war what is the cause of war according to thucydides he has said the cause of war is because of human greed and ambition it is because of human greed and ambition and because humans are greedy because humans are ambitious towards power war is therefore endless war therefore is endless because human greed and human ambition would never go they would always exist in some form in some civilization in some city states including as you move forward in the future and therefore war would always be commendless because humans would always be vying for power because they are greedy because they have an ambition for power apart from this one thing that he has said obviously about human nature which is related obviously that humans are greedy and ambitious for power he has also said that humans or mankind is power seeking man is power seeking man is power seeking and when because man is power seeking 
he does not believe that there is any morals there is no right or wrong there is only there is only if there is no right and wrong what is the power might might is right there are no moral idealistic arguments against war you are powerful you have the capacity and the capability of gaining power then do this it is your right because you are capable of doing this now if there is no moral right or wrong according to thucydides justice is therefore not the goal of power not the goal of power the goal of power is power itself power begets power justice is not the goal of power to ensure equality to ensure liberty to ensure freedom to ensure equitable justice is not the goal of power in this lastly in reference to human nature he says self help self help is an important aspect of human nature because the strong do what they want to do strong do what they desire to do and the weak have to accept it so for independent countries or independent city states or those who want to have a neutral or an independent position like the menials wanted you need to be strong if you want to maintain autonomy if you want to maintain independence if you want to remain neutral like the melos wanted in the peloponnesian war you need to be strong so that the powerful when they force you to do something that you do not want to do you are capable capable of resisting them okay. the next aspect that he talks about is that morality morality has no restraint as no restraint morality has no restraint restraint on conflict meaning if there is a conflict happening between any two states moral morals idealistic arguments have no place in that this is what has happened in the russia ukraine war a lot of countries including the europeans and the americans have made moral arguments idealistic arguments that what russia is doing is not morally right it is not correct as per international law has it affected the russian thinking or their actions no and this is a realist thinking given by thucydides that moral arguments have no restraint on conflict if a stronger power wants to indulge in a conflict wants to indulge in a conflict it is going to do so so any moral or idealistic argument that you may make that is not going to have any effect on them you saw this in the iraq war there was a lot of moralistic arguments given by the french indians and a lot of countries across the world that what george bush was doing in going into iraq was not correct did it stop him no the us went into the iraq war the russians went into the ukrainian war you look at our neighborhood india continuously makes moralistic and idealistic arguments the cross border terrorism that is coming from pakistan is not right it is not right under international law it is not right under moral arguments also has it stopped them no it has not this is what thucydides has said about cause of war human nature and morality the next aspect we come to is thucydides trap what is meant by thucydides trap in contemporary thinkings 
the basic idea is that future of relationship, future of relations between the hegemonic power, between the hegemon and the rising power, and the rising power would always be war. It would always be conflict. Because the hegemon has insecurities. Because the hegemon has insecurity. And the rising power wants change. It wants change to the global order. It wants change to its own standing or its own image in international politics. And these two reasons together would be the cause of conflict between the hegemon and the rising power. This term has actually been coined by Graham T. Ellison. Graham T. Ellison. Uh, he has said, and he's talking about in reference to USA and China, that he has studied several conflicts over the historical period. And he has said that most of them, in which the, there was a rising power and there was a hegemon and dominant power, majority of these issues, or majority of time that it has happened in international politics, even in history, it has led to conflict majority of the times. And he says, a conflict between USA and China therefore becomes inevitable. It is most likely to happen. A likely conflict between USA and China. This is known as the Thucydides, Thucydides trap in current or contemporary international relations theory given by Graham T. Allison. There is obviously a critique to this. There is obviously now there is obviously a critique to this. Now, what is the critique to Thucydides' trap? The first critique, ancient history, ancient history is not applicable to modern history. It's not applicable to modern history. Basically, what has happened between Athens and Sparta does not mean it is going to be the same for USA and China or any hegemon power or rising power. Nevertheless, Graham T. Ellison has given a strong reply to this critique that he has said that he has studied most of history in which there was a rising power and there was a hegemon power and in majority of those cases it has led to conflict. It has led to a war. The second critique has actually been given by Joseph Nye. Now, what Joseph Nye, the famous thinker who has given the idea of soft power, his critique is not specifically about the Thucydides trap or the Thucydides trap. He has said that it is not the insecurity of the hegemon and the need for change by the rising power which is the cause of war or which is the cause of conflict. He says, stagnation, stagnation of the rising power, stagnation of the rising power is the cause. Stagnation of the rising power is the cause.
he has said that when there was a conflict between Sparta and Athens, it was not that Athens was rising. What had happened was that Athens had stagnated. And because it had stagnated, there was a belief in Sparta that they can defeat Athens. And which they did later on in the Peloponnesian War. They defeated, Sparta defeated Athens. And he has said that there might be insecurity within the dominant power or the hegemon. There might be a willingness or the want for change in the rising power. But that is not the main cause of conflict. He takes it up one step further. He says, stagnation of the rising power becomes the cause of conflict. As long as the power is rising, as long as, let's say, Athens is rising, as long as, let's say, China is rising, they're not willing to risk their rise for war. This is what has been the Chinese policy given by Deng Xiaoping. He has said, lay low. He has said to lay low, and when it, China is capable, when it rises enough, then let the world know about China. That is why they have given a particular date into the future for when they will take Taiwan back. They could have done this in the 90s, they could have done this today, but no, in the future they have given the date. Because they believe that by that time they would have risen enough. And if they indulge in a Taiwanese conflict today, it may hamper their rise. This, therefore, thinking of China goes in sync with Joseph, what Joseph Nye is saying, that it is the stagnation of the rising power which becomes the cause of war. So let's say if China, theoretically, hypothetically, does become stagnant, then the Americans might believe that, oh, now we have the capacity or the capability because China is stagnating to completely destroy them. Or completely contain them. But because China is continuously rising as of now, there is a fear in China or fear in the United States that they do not want to indulge in a war. Now apart from this, Joseph Nye has given one more reason. Obviously there is an assumption that if the rising power has stagnated, then it gives a good incentive to the hegemon or the dominant power to then attack the rising power and then contain it. There is a flip side to this, also given by Joseph Nye, that when the rising power stagnates, when the rising power stagnates, it lashes out. Because it has stagnating, it believes or the assumption comes in that it is the hegemon that has caused a decline or a halt in their rise. And therefore they lash out on the hegemonic power or the dominant power. And because they lash out and they're not capable of taking on the hegemon, they lose. There are two reasons now. First, that the rising power has stagnated. It gives an incentive to the dominant power to contain them. Second, the rising power has stagnated. But because it believes, the rising power believes that it is the dominant power because of which they have stagnated, they lash out at the dominant power. You see that the war is now being caused or started by two different powers. Hegemon during the first time, the rising power during the second. These are the two main critiques of Thucydides' trap. Now, how is it relevant for your PSIR examination? How can you use Thucydides' trap in your PSIR examination? The first question has been asked in your PSIR examination in 2022, critically examine the rise of China as a great power and its implication on Asian political order. Can you not use Thucydides' trap in this answer? Similarly, decline of USA as a hegemon and its implication for the changing international political order. Asked in 2021, PSIR examination, critically analyze the implication of Sino-American strategic rivalry for South and Southeast Asia region 2022. Consequences of America's, of Trump's America First and Xi's Chinese Dream on World Politics asked in PSIR examination 2018. All of these questions asked in paper 2, section A. 
And there is a continuous theme that you can see. It is on USA and China. Hughes, Graham, Graham T. Ellison has coined the term Thucydides trap in reference to USA and China politics. Use it in your answer. Similarly, if a question does come on, let's say, India and China, in reference to, let's say, South Asia or Indo-Pacific, use Thucydides trap. It has been continuously used or being regularly used within the Indian Express, the Hindu, and any other newspaper that you follow. It is being used by strategic thinkers. It has been used in reference to Russia-Ukraine war, India and China, and obviously the term has been coined in reference to USA and China. Apart from this, I've also made another video on Panipas syndrome. This was in reference to uh, paper two, section B. This video on Thucydides trap is from paper two, section A. This on Panipat syndrome has been from paper two, section B. If you have any doubt, my email is given in the description below. You reach out to me. If you want to come and meet me, you come to the Bengaluru branch of Rao's IES. I'll be here and we can meet. And if you have any doubt about this topic, about PSIR, we can talk about it. Take care, everyone.